You are listening to the Marginalized Conflicts podcast series, a project of the Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies course at Colgate University in fall 2008. As a collective, we selected present and past conflicts which we feel are marginalized, either in our own study of history and politics or in dominant narratives of both. We aim to inform, surprise, shock, and inspire. I am Andrew Eldridge, and today's podcast is an examination of South Africa under apartheid and a look into the successes and struggles of a nation emerging in the post-apartheid era. Today, South Africa is a beacon of hope in a continent scorched by poverty, disease, and conflict. South Africa has a promising economy and a functioning democratic system. Over the past decade and a half, steps have been taken towards greater equality and tolerance, yet things were not always this way. Removing the cloak of modernity unveils a history of oppression, discrimination, and exploitation. This dark past can be summed up by one word, apartheid. From 1948 to 1990, South Africa functioned under a system of state racism. This was characterized by a white European minority known as the Afrikaners ruling over a black majority. The Afrikaners were represented in government by the National Party, or NP, which dominated the political arena in the name of white supremacy. During the reign of apartheid, the NP terrorized the black population through brutal abuses and a disregard for human rights. One might ask, how was such an oppressive system formed? Apartheid has its roots in colonization. British imperialism brought white settlers to South Africa, and the flow of Europeans continued to increase with industrialization in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The influx of white settlers was paired with an overwhelming tide of white domination and ascendancy, which seeped into the foundation of South African society. Apartheid came about as a manifestation of Afrikaner nationalism. The ideological backbone was the maintenance of a pure white race as the dominating force in all areas of society. The National Party mandated segregation, not only as a mechanism for sustainable control and power, but also as a means to solving the race conflict. It was argued that by separating the blacks and whites, racial tensions would reduce and bring a lasting peace. Apartheid was a system of total discrimination, affecting all sectors of life. A newspaper article in 1974 reported on the suicide of a 20-year-old colored man, meaning he was of Asian descent, a group that was also discriminated against in South Africa. The man threw himself under a train in a Cape Town station when he learned that his girlfriend, a white girl, was pregnant. The National Party passed a series of comprehensive acts to enforce segregation. No longer could a black man marry or have a relation with a white woman. No longer could black families live amongst white families, eat at white-owned restaurants, or work in white business areas. No longer could the black majority elect a black man to represent them in government. Segregation represented Afrikaner hatred and served as a framework for oppression. Mandela, a 16-year-old black boy, was sent with his brother one day to buy bread for his family. While talking with friends outside the bakery, Mandela was shot dead by South African police in an oncoming armored vehicle. His brother was then detained for a year and tortured without trial. Pizzi was playing football with his friends on a warm July day in 1986. A passing police officer decided to break up the blacks' football match. The officer harassed the group and singled out Pizzi for his attitude. As the boys scattered, the officer chased Pizzi down and shot him in the back. In 1985, James, along with many other black activists, marched through the streets and sang freedom songs. In response, the police opened fire on the crowd, killing James and several others. These stories offer only a glimpse into the years of terror and destruction exerted on black South Africans under apartheid. To maintain control over the oppressed masses, police brutality was utilized through the forms of arbitrary arrests torture, and murder. This tactic of fear, commonly used in other conflicts, effectively implemented the continuum of white dominance. However, physical assault was not the National Party's only form of abuse. Psychological pain and suffering was equally destructive. This can be attributed to constant disenfranchisement, vitalized by a system of inequality. From segregation in the school systems to the legal status of secondary citizenship, blacks endured an overwhelming sense of worthlessness. Such discrimination significantly inhibited black South Africans 
in their pursuit for happy and fulfilling lives. As the years passed, the winds of oppression sweeping across South Africa began to turn. During the late 1980s, civil unrest boiled over. The black opposition was represented by the banned African National Congress, which rallied underground and clashed against Afrikaner cruelty. To repress the growing opposition, the NP declared a state of emergency. During these final years, detentions and human rights abuses reached an all-time high. Due to the combination of ongoing conflict, mounting international pressure, and economic recession, the National Party finally agreed to recognize and negotiate with the ANC opposition. Over the course of the early 1990s, these negotiations led to the dismissal of the apartheid system and a democratic election of South Africa's first black president, Nelson Mandela. To be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Rallying behind the inspirational words of Nelson Mandela, South Africans embraced tolerance and spread equality. In the coming years, the nation experienced relative stability, democracy, and prosperity. Such a resume empowered South Africa as a leader in a neighborhood plagued by ruthless dictators, internal strife, and economic hardship. How has South Africa fared in this new leadership role? The newly democratic nation has used its influence in mitigating war-torn regions like the Congo, as well as to create institutions like the African Union. Furthermore, South Africa has served as the prototype for success in a region drained of hope. However, in most recent years, South Africa has faltered as a regional power. Zimbabwe, bordering to the north, is in shambles. President Mugabe has continually abused his people and brought the nation's economy to a state of disarray, unparalleled around the world. As past victims of oppression and hardship, it must be imagined that South Africans would take the helm in constructing change. Yet South Africa has been soft and unresponsive, allowing Zimbabwe to fall into the depths of despair. The second section of this podcast will examine international response to conflict and what obligation nations have to others. What was the international response during the reign of apartheid? It is important to note that during the early years of apartheid, many other nations, including the United States, were involved in their own civil rights struggles. However, by the 1960s, apartheid was condemned on an international scale by the United Nations. Yet, moral indignation by itself is not a foreign policy, as declared by the U.S. State Department. Some leaders argued that economic sanctions should be used as a weapon to pressure the apartheid regime into reform. The UN enforced an arms embargo against South Africa, but no stronger economic sanctions were agreed upon. Many of the Western powers, such as the US, were wary of cutting economic ties with such a large trading partner. Should the United States have done more in opposing and combating apartheid? The severity of human rights abuses and the unjustness of discriminatory laws under apartheid were never in question. However, in taking an aggressive stance, each country must first identify their own national interest. The U.S. State Department expressed that, we are only indirect participants in a vital political process taking place 8,000 miles away. Apartheid was far from the sole instance of human rights abuses taking place around the world during its time span. Although the United States must oppose such violations, I agree that America cannot and should not respond directly to each human rights conflict. In contrast, I argue that South Africa has not only a moral responsibility, but also a commanding national interest to take a hardline stance with Zimbabwe. An ocean separates America from South Africa, but Zimbabwe lies at its doorstep. It is a threat to South African security and national interest by having a failed state to the north. Specifically, thousands of refugees have fled Zimbabwe for South Africa's borders. The newly elected South African president must take a direct line of talk with the coalition Zimbabwean government and not balk at the stubbornness of President Mugabe. South Africa must offer guidance in the political and economic spheres to help Zimbabwe overcome their woes and progress in the future. South Africa cannot afford to turn away from their newfound regional leadership. To do so would show grave disregard for the suffering under apartheid and tarnish the transition to a democratic state. In conclusion, I will leave you with a few words on the current condition of South Africa. In the light of its successes, 14 years removed from apartheid, South Africa is still not the rainbow nation envisioned by Nelson Mandela. Too little has been done to curb poverty, crime, and inequality. Rooftops of concrete, sheet metal, and scrap wood stretch as far as the eye can see in desolate shanty towns. These feeble shacks are home to the amassing unemployed and hopelessly impoverished. Though positive steps have been taken towards equality, the nation remains largely divided. 
The most affluent settlements remain exclusively white, and the economic divide between the majority of blacks and whites remains high. The rate of violent robberies and crime is one of the highest globally and has inflamed ethnic tensions. This podcast has shown South Africa's remarkable journey from the oppressive system of apartheid to a tolerant democratic society. In the coming years, South Africa must embrace its role as a regional leader while continuing to reform and solve its own domestic problems. Thank you for listening. This series is made possible by a collaboration among Clarence Maybe, Raynar Deli, Rich Grant, Tyrell Habercorn, the Student Audio Assistants, and the members of Introduction to Peace and Conflict Studies at Colgate University. The music is provided by Poddington Bear. Thank you very much. <laughs>